when uh, last night my wife and I were in the kitchen and we were talking and just chatting and um, my wife had asked me if I heard about what happened to certain UPS drivers. Now I hear some O's, oh, so evidently you've heard it too. Um, she told me that in different cities, um, I don't know about here in Arizona, now someone told her that uh, UPS drivers in different cities in our country have been killed. Um, now, I'm, this is my conclusion, it's because of the Christmas season and UPS drivers are delivering packages to homes, etc. And what I told her, I said, well, you know, the FedEx drivers are next. Um, but we have come to, I never heard of, of this before, maybe it has happened, but it is a sad day when people are now assaulting and even killing UPS drivers. Uh, delivering packages to homes. Um, of course, when you do that, then you have access to all kinds of packages in those brown trucks that, you know, that uh, we see so often in our neighborhoods. Um, you know, when, when we were sharing that, I'd said something to the fact, you know, what is our world coming to when you hear of things like this in the news? Uh, the condition of our world in different areas. Politically, of course, we've been hearing the news that has happened in the last number of weeks about the impeachment process of Donald Trump and the uh, pros and cons or the agreements and disagreements. One side of the aisle in Congress says, you know, he's guilty. The other side is saying it's just a farce, you know. Um, and then in our, our social world, we have heard things such as suicides being committed because of bullies on social media. How many of you ever heard of that? And, um, young people being intimidated, not knowing how to process these things. When I was in high school, um, I was bullied when I went into the seventh grade. Um, I went to a very unique school. This was Eagle Rock High School in Los Angeles, where it is combined junior, we call it junior high school, not middle school, but it was combined junior and high school. So it's interesting, you go to school and you see seventh graders, they didn't share the same classes, but seventh graders are on the same campus as the seniors. And I remember getting bullied while I was a seventh grader. But what it actually it amounted to was this one bully would say something and a few other kids would laugh and that was it. You come out of the classroom and you're in another safe zone because you're with your friends, etc. That's not the way it is with social media nowadays. You know, uh, once somebody starts saying something, uh, the younger crowd, whether it's middle school or high school, they're all on it like that. And everybody knows about it. And some of these kids just don't know how to process these bullying, uh, these uh, things. and. They, and some of them, not everyone of course, some of them end up doing horrible things to themselves, such as suicide. Um, we all see the signs in the social world, how self seems to reign, selfishness seems to be on a rampage, um, whether it's killing a UPS driver because I want to, my assumption again, I want these packages for Christmas, etc. Or whether it's bullying, or whether it's, um, and I'm not making a political statement here, um, this isn't a partisan comment, but whether it's corruption in the uh, political process or in the political world and corruption in, in, in politics or in, in business, um, in the natural world. Just recently we went through a freeze in most of the United States um, the fires that have happened in California. I, uh, I pastored in Santa Rosa, California, where a couple of years ago, a lot of Santa Rosa burned down. And then I think it was being, I didn't catch up with the news on this one, but I think there was threats that it was going to, you know, it was in danger of uh, catching on fire again. Um, but the fires in California, um, earthquakes, tsunamis, 
um, we must not forget the, the damage that recent earthquakes has caused in Haiti. You remember the earthquakes in, Hades, in Haiti? Um, thousands and thousands killed. Um, Puerto Rico, they were out of electricity for months on end. I don't know if electricity has been restored. I can only assume by now it has. But we see a lot of disasters uh, happening or in our world today. I want to start this morning with that grim picture. Now, we are saddened when we hear of tragedies because of natural disasters in our world today. <clears throat> but I would say, I can only speak for myself, I would say that the things that tend to irk us most, bring us the most sadness, and yes, even anger, are the social ills that we are experiencing today. When people are just being mean against people, when uh, human, what God has gifted us with, is this, God has given us a, a nature that we are to be compassionate and kind and polite to each other and be respectful with each other. I believe that that's the way God wired us up. And it seems to be that this wiring, they're getting crossed, um, things that we would consider, you never say this, uh, whether it's in a popular song or whether it's in movies or whether it's amongst friends, Things that you just didn't say or were taboo are now, it just seems like it's, it's uh, you know, it's, uh, it's almost status quo today. And, you know, the sky is the limit as to what is said and what is done in the entertainment world. Um, we bemoan a lot of these things of the younger generation, things that are said and things that are done whether they're immoral or illegal or just base and vulgar. I personally believe that it's more of a parenting problem today than it is with a problem with children. It's parenting skills that are a big problem today. Um, it's not the magical answer. Some kids end up doing some pretty bad stuff and they were raised in good homes and good parenting. But there's less chance that a child would come out uh, some of the things that we see today and hear today. It's, there's less of a chance of that happening when there is very good loving, proper discipline, proper love and attention at home. When the family unit is strong, many of your societal ills will take care of themselves. The, the home is the first school. Why am I saying all of this? Because a lot of the troubles that we see in our world today, I believe is a problem of the heart. I think it is a spiritual problem. It is a problem of the human psyche. It is a problem of the human heart. Now let me share with you some of the ways that we try and deal with these problems. Some people may go to psychotherapists and go to counseling, which is good. Um, in many, many cases, these types of treatments help a person who is trying to deal with depression or, um, or just rabid anger. And um, people, some people will go to books and self-help books or self-help videos to try and deal with their issues. Um, most of the issues that affect us in the short and in the long term that affect us emotionally and mentally are relational issues. Relationships. We, are, we were created by God to be relational people. We are social people. We were created to mingle, to rub shoulders, to share thoughts and dreams and ideals and, and feelings. We weren't created to live alone and to be hermits. We were created to relate with each other. Some of those relationships are deeper than others, such as marital relationships, a relationship between parent and child. 
There's relationships, friends with friends. Whatever the case may be, we were created for relationships. And it's interesting that one of the things that has been attacked the most from a Christian perspective by the arch enemy whom we call Satan are relationships. Where sin affects the most and cause the most damage and ruin is in relationships. Now, it could be a macro relationship, it could be a micro relationship. It could be a macro relationship in the sense of nation in relation with other nation. Or on the smaller level, a mother with her daughter, a mother with her son, a father with his son, a wife and a husband more close to home. One country may want this done because they are protecting their interests. While another country says, no, we're not interested in your interests. We're interested in our interests as a country. We're thinking of our security and our safety. One country will say, well, you've got it wrong because the real situation is like this. While another country says, no, you're wrong. The situation is this way. In the history of humankind, there have been treaties that have been formulated and signed, and often those treaties are broken or forgotten. Why? Because it's a problem of the heart. The problem is an inner problem. It's a human problem. It's a sin problem. You've heard me say this before. Sin, S, spelling it right backwards, S-I-N, is an acronym for self-inflicted nonsense. That's basically what sin is. Sin is when we put self first. When we put my interests, my desires, my urges, my goals, my agendas, my feelings, it's when I put that first and I put you second. You're not as important as you are to the person called me. And that is self-inflicted nonsense. That is the real problem of the human race. We all see the political ills and the, the social illnesses and natural disasters and you can add much more. The real problem in our world today is sin. Some people, as I mentioned, seek to solve these problems in many, many ways. Many times we seek to satisfy our felt needs. There's a difference between real needs and felt needs. So let me give you an example. My felt need right now is I'm hungry. <laughs> I didn't eat breakfast this morning. I had two cups of tea, but I didn't eat breakfast. My way here, I was hungry. I'm still hungry. That's my felt need. We have a potluck lunch today. Thank God. <laughs> now when I go to that delicious food that has been prepared by all of you, thank you ahead of time, I can gorge myself to satisfy my felt need. I'll have three servings of food. I'm going to have oh, about five slices of the pumpkin pie over there. <laughs> I'll have, I don't know, 15 cookies, uh, four servings of lasagna, etc. Now there's a difference between meeting my felt need and what my real need is. My felt need is I'm hungry. Am I meeting my real need by eating that way that I just described? No, I'm not. I'm doing myself damage. And by the way, can I slip in a very uncomfortable step on your toes side note here? We often eat according to taste, not according to reason. Would you agree with that? Whether it's what we eat or the amount we eat. Now, I'm the first one to admit my weakness in this. My wife made delicious pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving. How many of you ate pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving? You know, Costco pumpkin pies don't compare to my wife's pumpkin pies. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm the first to admit, I'll have a piece of pie. 
I'll have a piece of pie and I'm full and what do you think I'll do? Oh, I'll get a second piece. <laughs> I'm not acting by reason, I'm acting by what? My felt need, my taste. And many of us seek to solve the problems of today by our felt needs instead of looking at what our real need is. And this is what I'm proposing this morning. The real problem is a sin problem. It's that self-inflicted nonsense that rises its ugly head all the time during the day. Now, what is sin? What is sin. The Bible says that basically sin is selfishness. It's putting yourself first. There's a scripture in the Bible that says sin is the transgression of the law. Now the Bible says that God made a law. We can call it the moral law or the ten words, the literal Hebrew <laughs> rendering of the Ten Commandments. The literal rendering is the ten words. That's God's moral law. God made this law for a purpose. He made it for the human race. And when we break that law, that is what the Bible calls sin. It is the transgressing of that law. Just like all of you never transgress the speed limit law, right? I know you never do that. But just like going over the speed limit, you just transgressed that law. So the Bible actually gives, it gives us various concepts of what sin is. The most basic one that we are used to hearing is sin is the transgression of the law. It's when you break, knowingly break a law. But sin goes much deeper than that. As I said, it is selfishness. But sin also touches the realm of your motives and intentions. Those things that are hidden from human sight, but that are completely exposed to God the Creator. So if I can, I can obey a literal commandment, just as Jesus said, well, just as the commandment says, thou shalt not commit adultery, the seventh commandment. But Jesus says, you don't really need to commit it literally and physically. If you've lusted after somebody in your heart, see, that's where it comes to the realm of my insides that are hidden from anybody else. And if I lust after anybody, I don't have to admit it to you, do I? I don't have to admit it to you. I don't have to physically, visibly reveal it, except for a stare but I could be doing it in my heart. So sin goes beyond just an external breaking of God's law. Sin goes what is going on in here, those processes, my urges, my desires. That's what sin is as well. That's why I said earlier, it causes havoc in relationships above everything else. That's what sin is. The Bible says the origin of sin does not come from heaven, but the origin of sin was in heaven. In other words, heaven didn't create it and invent it, but it started in heaven. The Bible says that we have an arch enemy. His name is Lucifer. The morning star, the bright one is what that name means. The Bible says that Lucifer was a beautiful angel. Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14. He was a beautiful angel. In fact, he was the captain of the angels, the big honchos, gorgeous, beautiful to look at, perfect in reasoning, high in intelligence, perfect in motives, perfect. God created a perfect angel. But this angel went wrong. This angel went bad. And then soon in heaven, there was Star Wars. That's the original Star Wars, by the way. <laughs> The original Star Wars is in heaven because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 that this Lucifer who became evil because of pride, you see, self-inflicted nonsense, Lucifer put himself first above God, above God's interests. He became bad and the Bible says he drew a third of the stars, a reference to the angels, 33%. 
of heaven's angels. He evidently persuaded and convinced to go to his side and there was war in heaven. So that's the first Star Wars. And they were kicked out. Finally, after God pleading with him. That's where sin originated in the heart of Lucifer. The Bible doesn't explain exactly the uh, substantial nature of how it started, but it explains its, exi its existence of where it started. And of course, as I said, it came down to earth. And what is the result of sin? The result of sin is me first. It's the blame game. If you read the book of Genesis in chapter 3, you read the story of Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve were caught red-handed with that the juice of the fruit still in their fingernails, and they were caught red-handed, their fingers were still sticky. The first thing, the first thing that Eve did when God confronted Eve is she put the blame on the snake. Instead of owning up, hey, if you made a mistake, if you did a boo-boo, if you messed up, own it and admit to it. It's your fault. You did it. That snake didn't have arms and tentacles to tie her down and pry her mouth open and stuff that fruit down her mouth. She had a choice. But the first thing she did was to play the blame game. Then God, well, God went to Adam first. God went to Adam. I think I mixed up my order. God went to Adam. What did Adam do? Played the blame game. He blamed Eve. And then that's when Eve blamed the snake. He blamed Eve. Hey, she, it's not my fault. She gave me the fruit. Somebody offers, somebody offers you, when I was a kid, you know, we were offered certain substances that were not very moral and healthy for the human body for consumption when I was in high school. And when somebody offered me this certain substance, I could have refused. But when I took it, somebody would ask me, oh, he gave it to me. No, I accepted it. We play the blame game. We play the blame game. That's one of the immediate results. And other result of sin is that we hide. We hide. If you do something wrong, and you know you did something wrong, are you going to say, hey, look what I did? Children take a cookie or a candy or a piece of cake that you're not supposed to. And mommy and daddy ask you, where's that piece of pie? Where's that piece of cake I left in the refrigerator? Are you going to say, guess what? I took it. Yippee! Look closely at my nips, daddy, my lips. See that chocolate? I did it. We don't do that. The nature of sin is not only do we play the blame game, but when there's nobody to blame, we hide, don't we? We don't want to admit to it. And then the other result, the final result, of course, the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. Is death. The wages of sin is death. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our real problem on planet Earth today. Now, there is a lot of good in the world. A lot of good. I don't want to paint a picture that everything is dark and that we are to cloister ourselves in a churchy setting and only hang around with churchy people and read and see churchy things and act churchy. That's not what I'm saying. There is a lot of good in this world. There's a lot of good people outside, meaning outside of our church circles, or unchurched people. There's a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of good out there. There's a lot of good organization and institutions that are not faith-based that are good. The American Red Cross, we're inviting the American Red Cross right here in our backyard to suck out your blood. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a good thing. But we have a systemic problem. We have a problem of substance of nature the problem is this, we're all born broken. I'm not saying infants go sin. Some of these little kids here, the little babies I saw, my wife and I were sitting right over here and I think it was Joel's, Joel's baby, the pianist. I'm assuming that was his kid. Did you see him crawling right here? 
little baby? And I told my wife, you know what he's looking at? He's looking at that gold. He's going for the gold. <laughs> his, his eyes were ripping on the gold. You know how babies are. They want to see shiny things. Well, if the baby would have done this and toppled this over. These are fake, by the way. <laughs> if he would have done this and grabbed it, I probably would not have said, oh, that baby is sinning. Oh, that baby is not being respectful to churchy things in a churchy setting. No, we are not, babies don't, are not sinning, but they are born, we're all born with that sinful nature. It's a natural brokenness to do the self-inflicted nonsense, putting self first. You even see this among children when they're playing marbles or when they're playing toys. You see this nature come out eventually when they become toddlers. I want this. No, I want that. Bang. Going to bop them on the head. <laughs> this is our real problem. The good news is the Bible says sin is solvable. Amen? Amen. I want to hear you clap to this one. <laughs> sin is solvable. Sin is solvable. Open your Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Jesus is having a conversation at night with this religious leader. We'll call him Nico. And uh, he tells him something very, very important that this religious leader needs to hear. And this is what he says. For God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only and unique son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have what? Everlasting life. And I love what verse 17 says. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to do what? God did not send his son into the world to condemn. condemn it. Now, all of you, I'm going to point the finger at you. <laughs> Remember, when I point the finger at you, I'm pointing three fingers back at me. Okay? So I'm involved. We're all sinners. We're all condemned. Because we're sinners. But the Bible says, when Jesus of Nazareth was born in Nazareth, in Bethlehem, and he came and he grew up in Nazareth, he didn't come to point the finger at you. Amen? Amen? He didn't come to condemn. But the Bible says he didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. Saved. Say that again. Saved. Saved. Say it louder. Saved. Jesus came to save us from sin. Amen? Amen. Sin is solvable. It's a horrible, terrible problem. But Jesus is the solution. And he didn't come to point the finger at you, to tell you how naughty you are, that you're not going to get any toys this Christmas because you've been naughty this year. I'll never forget one of the best illustrations I've ever heard came from Bill Hybels. Um, Bill Hybels is the pastor of a mega church. I think he still is. I haven't heard from him in a long time, but he's the pastor of a, a mega church, an independent church in uh, South Barrington, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. I've been to that church a couple of times back in the 90s, and he preached this amazing sermon. So I'm gonna share briefly his conversation between, with him and an individual on an airplane. He says he was speaking as uh, sitting next to this gentleman and the conversation came up, they started conversing and the conversation came up, you know, what do you do? And Bill Heibel said that he was a pastor of uh, Willow Creek Church over in South, uh, in Illinois. And in the conversation, Bill Hybels began to talk to this man about sin and salvation. And the man said, ah, I'm not interested in this, and etc." And so Bill Hybels began to ask him some very pertinent questions. Very, uh, you know, important, deep questions. And so one of the questions he asked him is, if you, 
But tell me why you think you deserve going to heaven. And, and this was a businessman, by the way. The businessman said, well, hey, you know, I, I'm faithful to my wife. Um, I try and be honest in my business. He began to share some good things that he has done. And that's why, you know, I'm not a murderer. I don't do horrible things. Sure, maybe I've lied once or twice, etc. So Bill Hybels, he took out a napkin. The napkin. They were sitting right next to them, together on the plane. He took out the napkin and he drew a grid. And he said, well, let me do something here. And he drew a grid, sort of like a one of those miniature golf scorecards where it has a lot of little squares. He drew a lot of little squares. And uh, <laughs> so one section was good and one section was bad. And so he said, well, I'll tell you what. He says, the Bible says that no sinner can go to heaven that is unrepentant and doesn't accept God. He says, nobody in, is going to be in heaven that will keep on sinning. You can't go to heaven um, with all of your, you have to be perfect. He says, the Bible says you have to be perfect to go to heaven. And this is another message, but that perfection comes through Jesus Christ. So just tuck that in the back of your mind. So he says, so tell me, he says, have you ever lied? Well, yeah, who doesn't lie once in a while? And he writes a check. Have you ever done this and this and that? And he starts writing all these checks and he says, well, the Bible says that you can't go to heaven while this, I mean, look at your scorecard. And he holds it, look at your scorecard. And he says, I could, Bill Heibel says, I could just see that man, his eyes, you could just see the gears clicking in his brain of what he was, he says, man, Bill Heibel says, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. I mean, God is going to look at your scorecard. And he says, and then he gives this other illustration that your good cannot outdo the bad. And he said something to the effect, if somebody goes to court because they murdered somebody, the person on trial is not going to say, yeah, but I did a lot of good things in my life, judge. So shouldn't you pardon me even though I murdered this person? That's not the way justice works. You're in deep trouble, buddy. And he could just see the man just was quiet and was just thinking and processing these things. And then Bill Hybels drew a ladder, a little ladder, and told me, here's another illustration. And he drew a ladder. If, if the top of this ladder represents God's perfection and his glory, this is perfection. This is God. And if you can put yourself on this ladder, he says, now, Bill Hybel says this, I've personally met with Billy Graham. I know Billy Graham. And if I know Billy Graham, the latter being God here at the top, Billy Graham would probably put his X about down here. And Bill Heibel, as far as perfection is concerned. And he says, I've also talked with Mother Teresa. And Mother Teresa would probably be around that general area. Now these are both godly people they've done much good in this world and look where they would put their ex on this ladder of perfection what are you going to do oh and he asked he asked the gentleman where would you put your ex if billy graham and mother Teresa are down here where would you put your ex on this ladder the man just thought about it you're in trouble and then he started talking about Jesus. And that's what I want to say today. Jesus offered his life for you. Jesus came and died for your sins. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus died for our sins, although he was sinless. The Bible says he never committed one sin, and yet he died for your sins so that you would not have to suffer the penalty of eternal damnation. So that the life that he deserved, you could live and have eternal life forever and ever and ever. And explaining this, Bill Hybels drew a cross on that napkin and he drew a dotted line. And he said to the gentleman, this is too good to be true. The only thing that Jesus asks you 
is to accept him as your savior. All you have to do is sign on the dotted line and accept Jesus as your savior right now. And guess what the man did, the businessman on the plane? I can't. I just can't. Jesus came to this world sinless and holy, laid all of heaven and all the glitter and pomp and circumstance and glory that he had in heaven. He laid it all aside and he put on the flesh and bones of a human being. You've heard me say this before. It's like you going to the shoreline and seeing a little tiny crab and becoming a crab for the rest of your life. How many of you would like to become a little crab? He put on something inferior, became a human for us, not to condemn the world of its sin, but to save the world. That's why Jesus, once he was criticized, and they were religious leaders were saying, hey, how, come, how can you stand sitting with these people? How can you eat with those people? How can you with those sinners? They're known sinners. How can you sit with that prostitute? How can you sit with that person who collects taxes for the Romans? And, I mean, these people who are sick in the inside and the outside, how can you sit with them? And what was Jesus' classic response? And by the way, it's as if you and I are the leper. You and I are the prostitutes. You and I are the sinners. And Jesus' classic response was, I didn't come for the righteous people. I came to save sinners. I came to save sinners. And this is what the world needs today. The world needs today the solution to their real problem the solution to our heart problem, the solution to our sight problem. We need salvation and mercy and grace and forgiveness from Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is the real solution. So how do you receive Jesus as your savior? First and foremost, we have to recognize our need. How many of us have heard Al-Anon or these other very, very good programs out there. The first answer to your problem is you have to realize you have what? A problem. You have to acknowledge you have a sin problem. You try and do good and yet you lie. You try and be faithful and yet you become unfaithful, even if it's even in your thoughts. You try and be honest and you catch yourself being dishonest. You try and be perfect throughout the day and yet you stumble. We have to recognize our real problem. We have a spiritual problem. We have a heart problem. We have a problem of the nature. We have to recognize that. The second thing is that we come to Christ as we are. The Bible says in Matthew 11, the very last part of the chapter, verses 20 to 9, 30, the Bible says, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. I'll give you peace in your heart, in your life. I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest from your shame and from your guilt, from your sins. I'll give you rest from your lack of self-respect and self-love. I can restore you. And I'll give you rest from that guilt that's pressing you down. I can forgive your sins. I'll give you rest. Jesus says, learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. Take me upon yourself, and you'll discover that, hey, it's a lot better than my guilty, sinful, shameful life. Following Jesus, it's not for the cowardly, it's for the champions, but it's a lot lighter in the conscience and in the human spirit than it is trying to wrestle with sin and trying to figure out how to solve that problem by ourselves. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Recognize your need. 
Come to Jesus as you are, and then repent of your sins. And then repent. Notice the order here, very important. I didn't say repent of your sins and then come to Jesus. It's not what I said. You come to Jesus first and his loving arms that embraces you and you come as you are, that love and that grace will lead you to repentance. It'll soften and subdue your heart. He'll melt you. That's the answer. You repent of your sins and you ask him to be your Lord and Savior of your life. This is what the world really needs. This is the real solution. So I'm gonna ask you, do you want the solution in your life? Do you want the solution in your life? You can do it now. You don't have to wait until tomorrow. You don't have to think about it. If down deep in your conscience, you feel that God is telling you that this is truth. Why wait? So I wanna invite you, if you want the Lord as your savior, to come to the front. If you want to accept Jesus, Lord, I want you to be my Savior, I want to be my Lord. Don't worry about people think. I'm serious, don't worry about people think. Just make the intelligent choice. So I want you to come down in front, if that is your wish. Don't let this day pass. Come down to the front, if this is your wish. Amen. Amen. She's going to be playing the organ for us. Thank you, Beverly. But come on to the front. To have Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord, this is the real solution. And then we're going to have a word of prayer. And then we're going to have lunch. Come on forward. Amen. Everybody say amen. 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 Beverly, can you do a little bit of a musical background for us as we pray, please? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for being the answer for this entire world. Thank you, Jesus, you came to save us from our sins. You came to forgive us of those sins and, Lord, to restore dignity and honor and self-love and self-respect in our lives. Jesus, we know that sin is very destructive because we've all experienced its destructiveness. So, Lord, we thank you for being the solution not only to this world, but to us personally as individuals. Jesus, I want to ask a special prayer and anointing over those who are here at the front. Lord, be their Savior, be their guide, be their Lord. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive them of their sins, Lord Jesus. Bring eternal life into their hearts. Bring peace, Lord. Bring peace into their minds. Assure them that you accept them as they are. They have come to you. And Lord, minister to them through your Holy Spirit. That your life will be their life. I pray, Lord, that your thoughts, your intentions, your deeds will be theirs, will be ours. Begin this transforming process in their lives, Lord Jesus. For those who have accepted you already, some have walked with you, Lord, for a long time. I pray that you will always fill them with your Holy Spirit, that they will walk with you a close and intimate walk, that your joy and peace may be experienced in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, and we all said, Amen. 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 You can go back to your seats. God bless you.